I think goal setting is a fascinating topic. I wish that schools had the opportunity to teach it in school all the time, because as much as I'm going to give you, you parents some really great tools, I know that it's not always easy to get your kids to sit down and listen to you, especially after they're about the age of seven or eight. They usually say, you know, mom, dad, this isn't assigned, so I don't have to do it. But goal setting is really, really valuable. Any of you guys, and I know many of you are teachers out there, you work in school districts, so I know I'm talking to both educators and parents and also therapists and whatnot. Anyone ever hear your kids just saying things that, you know, they've been thinking maybe inside their head or to their friends, like, I'm going to get all A's this year, or I'm going to make the baseball team, or I know I'm going to make new friends this year, right? Or I'm not going to get in any fights this year. Or I won't let myself get bullied. These are all the things that kids think about, that they want, that their wishes, that they're hoping for. And the problem is that a goal without a plan is really just a wish. It's not an actual goal. It's a it's it's almost in many cases like magical thinking, right? Like I'm gonna get all A's. You know, we have to see what's behind it. So without a well thought out detailed plan, it's really nothing more than a dream, bravado, or magical thinking. But interestingly, research has shown us that when people set goals and actually work toward them, not only do they perform better, but the ex they experience much less stress in their lives. And who couldn't use less stress in our lives right now, right? You feel less anxiety, and you're happier and more satisfied. Because if you think about it, you have a pathway. You, you, you are visualizing a future that you're hoping to create, but you need to have that actual plan to go along with it. So I want to just talk briefly about what are the benefits of actually setting goals. And when I say setting goals, I mean specifically actionable goals, and we'll talk about what that means. First of all, it really helps you prioritize what's important. I know that when I set a goal, I always have to think about it in, in relation to what else I'm doing. I once actually was seeing a business coach and he said to me, what's your mission statement? And I kind of knew what my mission was for, for my practice and everything. But he said, no, if you don't know exactly what your mission is, what your goal is, then how do you know if you want to say yes or no to different opportunities? And that's really true. So this is what's going to help you prioritize what's really important. If you have a goal that you're going to, I don't know, lose 10 pounds or exercise five days a week or whatever else that is, if you have other things that are important in your life and you're not prioritizing those things, well, maybe it's not as important as you think it is for right now in this moment. So there's lots of re different reasons why people aren't achieving what they hope to achieve. It's not just that they're not trying. It's that they're not maybe acknowledging that other things are taking precedence right now. Also, it helps you think positively about the possibilities in your life. When we have goals, and this is why the research found that it reduces the stress, when we have goals, we're really, we're really more actively creating what we want. So you're thinking about what what you what you're wanting to change and make better obviously it helps you design a pathway so you actually have a way to get from point a to point b and it also helps you push yourself toward your true desires you know the best goals are the ones that are a bit of a reach right otherwise it's not really much of a goal but if it's too much of a reach right then that's also it's almost like not just a distraction, but it's a deterrent. And the thing I'll say about students and goals is grown-ups too. And I really want to emphasize how you as the adult are living your life because one of the best ways to teach your kids goals is let them see you do it yourself, right? The goals you set for yourself and you're verbalizing how you're handling it. Those of you out there who know what executive functions are and have heard me talk about that before, I always say that one of the most important executive function skills that we have is metacognition. 
metacognition is thinking about what you're thinking about. It's that self-talk. So by having a rich internal conversation, that's how we really help ourselves do what we intend to do. Well, for your kids, if they can hear your internal conversation out loud, that's really modeling for them. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is really going to be learning from the past. Learning from the past, because that's what one of the things that helps us realize where maybe things did work or maybe they didn't work. So memory is used to recall situations and experiences from the past and compare it to similar situations in the present. So I'm going to be talking to you about something I call magical moments on the mountain. And these are those positive past experiences that can be used as a catalyst toward goal setting. These are actually the moments that remind us of the possibilities that became realities. I'm going to give you an example from my own life. So a little more than 10 years ago, I had really never ridden a bicycle more than, I don't know, about four miles at a time. I used to ride my kids around the neighborhood, you know, just a little leisurely ride, nothing really major. But for various reasons, I decided that I was going to sign up for a 100-mile bike ride, 100-mile bike ride um, that was to be accomplished in one day. Now, obviously, I wasn't going out and doing that the next day. I needed to train. Now, the story you tell yourself is very important. I'll explain what I mean by that. But what I did was, by the time I joined the team, and it was something called team and training. Some of you may have seen that in your states. They raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And they have lots of different activities. And one of them is bike riding. They have marathons, triathlons, all those kinds of things. Anyway, so I signed up to join this team. And by the time I signed up, they were already partway into their training season. and when I showed up for my first training ride on a Sunday morning in March, they were already up to doing 35 miles that day. I thought, oh my God, 35 miles. I can't ride a bicycle 35 miles. That's just not going to happen. I'll do the best I can do. But the coach stayed with me the whole day. She taught me what to do. And by the way, those of you who are road, road cyclists, you know, those skinny tires and clipping in and wearing that kind of diaper, you know, those, those, those shorts that have that big extra padding. I didn't know from any of that. I showed up in my cement truck of a bicycle, right? Coach stayed with me the whole day. And she said, come on, you know, you can do this and just look at the next tree, just look at the next goal, whatever it is. And by the end of the day, I did 35 miles. I was like, wow, this is great. Oh my God. Of course, the next day I could barely walk, right? But the next week, now they're up to 40 miles. I thought, huh, I've done 35 miles. I guess I can do 40. And then they were up to 45 and 50. Well, the long story, the long end of this is that I did my 100 mile bike ride. In fact, I've now done six century rides and two of them were in Lake Tahoe. For those of you not familiar with Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe is a ski, a ski area, right? It's mountains. So literally did that. But that was my magical moment on the mountain. And I don't mean literally on the mountain. I mean figuratively because Ever since I did that and accomplished that, I use that as my basis for setting goals because I know how to push myself. I know what that means. And I take from that experience things that have transferred into me building my practice as I have. So one of the things I'm going to encourage you guys to do is really talk to your kids about their magical moment on the mountain. But guess who you got to start with? You got to start with yourself. You're going to want to give them examples. So I want you right now to start thinking about when was a time in your life where you felt like you were on top of the world, where you really felt a sense of accomplishment, of fulfillment, and maybe even acknowledgement from others, right? Because that always feels good, right? So a magical moment, you want to learn maybe when you learned how to ride a bicycle, or maybe when you did well on a challenging test. Or when you entered a place where you didn't know anyone yet, right? That whole social anxiety piece. So I want you to think about it for yourself. And then I want you to be able to help your kids think about what was their magical moment on the mountain. What was something that they learned how to do? Even learning how to tie a shoe or raise your hand in a classroom. 
God knows this year was with uh, COVID, we've had lots of different experiences that we weren't really set up for, right? So we've, we've achieved a lot just by showing up. So the lessons that you learn in these magical moments, think about why was this goal important to you? You might talk to your child, why was it important to you that you learned to ride a bicycle? Now, of course, at the time they were learning to ride a bicycle, they weren't necessarily thinking about this, but you can help them come come up with you know the values in it. How did you feel when you accomplished this goal? And what talents and strengths did you call upon in your magical moments? I know that when I was doing my bike ride, one of the things I called upon was my ability to you know to persevere, to not give up, to call upon the past experience that last week I had done you know X amount of miles. I called upon my friendships that I had developed with the with my teammates, seeing them and you know having them say, "Hey, you know what, come on, you can do it." But you want to think about what what did you call upon? How can you use these strengths when you're faced with other challenges in your life? And finally, is there an image or a word or a symbol that instantly reminds you of what you did? I had literally a little statue of a bicycle on my desk. So as I was building my practice and came across, you know, big challenges, having to speak in front of me, all sorts of things, I would look at that bicycle and that would remind me of my strength. Okay. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, setting goals. So in terms of students, I want to talk about two different types of goals, the personal performance goals and the personal, I'm sorry, the performance goals and the personal development goals. And I'll help you distinguish between the two. But in thinking about how you're going to set goals, one of the first things you want to do is you want to take stock of where you are now. So one of the tools that we use as coaches very often is something called the wheel of life. And you can just draw a circle and this particular one has eight quadrants, right? You could do it with six or four, you know, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. And think of the center, right, as zero. Think of the outside as 10. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting something in each of these quadrants, and I'll give you some guidance for that. And then we're going to measure where are you in that, in terms of your satisfaction toward being proficient in that area. Okay? So if you were going to use this for yourself, and I strongly recommend you do that, one of the things that uh, many parents will put, and well, let's just start with adults. Many adults might put things like my financial world my spiritual world, my exercise, my health, my friendships, my marriage, my parenting, right? Put all those things and then see, well, how satisfied am I in each of these different areas? Because when you start to see that, then you know where you want to really work. One of the things I tell parents is you may want to have a parenting wheel of how satisfied are you in your different roles as parent, right? Your um, your role as their career coach, your role as their, you know, their friend, as their academic person, as, you know, all of these, their spiritual guide, all of those things, right? So for the students, I've filled in um, two different wheels that I'm going to show you, but I'm going to suggest that you don't just show them filled in wheels. It's better if you do that out loud with them because the whole conversation is going to be instructive for them. So, for example, here we go. The first wheel that I'll show you might be their wheel having to do with work, with, with work, well, with school, which for them is their work, right? So how do they feel about themselves in terms of their skill to take notes? Now, obviously, the younger kids don't take notes as much, but by the time they get to middle school and high school, the ability to take notes is very important. By the way, if you need support in note-taking, I'm sure you can ask the teachers, but I know if we were all together and I would ask you to raise your hand, when did most of us learn how to take notes? I would say from having asked this question before, most people learn in college because that's when we realize how important it is. But this is a great skill for kids to learn to do, okay? Study skills. I'll tell you one of the things I always talk about with parents when we talk about um, 
managing homework and the whole study process. Kids will just say, oh, I have to study. Well, what does that mean? What are their study skills? Do they know how to study differently from math and for science and for English, right? It should be very task oriented so that they break it up into different events for each night that they're studying a different way. So there's a whole, there's a whole learning that kids can do around developing strong study skills. Then of course there's time management. How are their time management skills? Do they have techniques that are working for them? There's tons of techniques out there. Same thing with organization. Right? How organized are they? Is it getting in their way? Are they more organized for certain subjects than others? Stress management. Do they know how to walk into a test feeling relaxed and confident? Do they know how to manage the stress of their friendships and their homework and all of those things? Um, taking quizzes. Again, what are their skills and strategies for that? Writing papers. Writing papers is, is so much more complex and it really requires all of your executive function skills, your ability to plan and organize and manage your frustration, all of these different things, right? And then, of course, self-advocacy. One thing I always want to tell parents and teachers is that advocacy is a developmental skill. It can't be an expectation. I don't care whether the kid's five years old or 15 or they're in college or they're the adults in the room with me. Not everybody feels comfortable. So these are skills that we want to help kids develop. Okay. Now, another way you can look at the wheel, and again, I would do this interactively, is the different aspects of their life, their social life, their leisure time. Some kids feel like they have no leisure time. Well, maybe we want to look at why, what's getting in the way, or what do they want to do with that leisure time, their schoolwork, their thoughts of their future their friendships, their exercise. This is so important for their mental health, right? Their physical health, their mental health, their hobbies, their recreation, their family relationships. So you really can do anything you want with these wheels. One thing I encourage, though, is a lot of times kids will say, oh, I'm great on all of these, right? Or I'm terrible on all of these. I want to help them distinguish so that they're not rating everything the same so I would suggest that the total value, if you're going to have eight sections and you can play around with it if you have less than sessions, less sections, the total value can't act up to more than 40 points and you can't have less than 15 points. I'm asking them to really make sure that they're not doing everything the same. Okay. Now, in terms of taking this wheel and making it actionable, you want to use it so you start choosing effective goals. So I might take one or two of those pieces of the wheel, right? And I might come up with one performance goal and one personal development goal. You don't want to be working on too many goals at one time. That's not going to be helpful, right? But the goal must be important to them personally, which means that even though you think that their goal should be that they should get better study skills, that may not be what they want to do. I would rather have them learn how to successfully set goals and in round one, and then we can talk about stretching them and what other goals might be important. I know parents are always worried about, you know, their kids and how they're doing academically and how can I push them along. I know from my parent coaching, if you don't have an invested partner in this, you could do all the work you want. We're not going to move them forward. Okay. So the goal has to also be within their ability and control. This is why I don't always like the goal being, I'm going to get an A, unless that's truly something they can control. Because let's say the teacher didn't view their paper in quite the same way that they did. Let's say that they had a really bad cold that day or something. It's not 100% in their control. So you want to help them figure out what are the goals that are in your control. Okay. And then talk to them about why is this goal important to you? What are some of the benefits for you in reaching this goal? What do you want to be different about your life? How will you know that you achieve the goal? What's going to be different in your life? How are you going to feel once you achieve the goal? I think it's really great to celebrate when you achieve a goal. It doesn't have to be a big monetary purchase, right? But it can be acknowledged. I know one of the things that's really frustrating, especially for kids who have learning disabilities, 
um, or ADHD or just any challenges, that every time they reach a milestone, someone says, great, okay, now you can do this. And we, we jump to, okay, what's the next thing? And they never get that sense of accomplishment or completion, right? So you want to make sure that you are acknowledging these steps along the way. Now, how do we best achieve our goals? One of the best things you could do is write it down. Now, many of your kids are going to be resistant to writing these things down. Why? They don't want to be held accountable, right? They don't want to share with anyone else what their goal is because they don't want someone else, you know, that feels vulnerable, right? When you share your goal with someone else. But I would encourage them to write it down, even if it's something that they're keeping for themselves. Here's a quote that I love. This is from Gail Devers. Many of you know her from her time as an Olympian. When I write a goal down and I truly write it down, it becomes part of me. That's a contract I sign with myself and I say, I don't care what happens. I'm going to stay on this path. I'm going to try and see this through. I'm going to give it my best shot and my best effort. It's really a commitment to yourself, okay? Now, I brought up Gail Devers. I like to show a lot of um, really good, I think, role models, okay? Because when you can look toward a role model, it really can help you. One of the things I encourage teachers to do is have kids research someone that they really admire. And what they will generally find is that, you know, took them a lot more work to get there than they thought. You look at Michael Jordan, and of course, unfortunately, the kids don't know who Michael Jordan is these days, except for maybe his sneakers. But if you if you knew Michael Jordan's story, you would know how much effort went into his achievement. In fact, when he was done playing basketball for a while, he played baseball, and he was known that he was the first one out there on the field each day and the last one to leave. He put tremendous hours. One book I want to write to, uh, recommend that you read. Um, that you read with your kids, and I'll say it twice, so don't worry if, if you want to grab a pen, is um, by Michael Gladwell, uh, yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, I'm sorry, Malcolm Gladwell. It's called The Outliers, Outliers. There's a chapter in there called 10,000 Hours to Mastery, where he talks about people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and the Beatles, and you really see the effort that went into their work. So that's why I think it's really valuable for kids to research and understand how someone achieved what they did, okay? So what are the obstacles that those people faced? And what did they do to overcome their obstacles? Now, I want to talk about um, how to set effective goals and make them SMART. I'm sure many of you have heard the term SMART goals before, but I want to go through this step by step. But for a goal to be more than a dream or a wish, we need to make sure that it is literally a SMART goal. So let's see what that is. First thing is it has to be specific. You want to define the goal as much as possible with positive, powerful language. You want to talk about who's involved in the goal. What do you want to accomplish? Where will it be done? Why are you doing the goal? So as specific as you can really name that. Next thing is, you want it to be measurable. How am I going to know that I accomplished this goal? Right? Let's say it's, you know, if you're losing weight, let's say you see it on the scale. Um, if you're wanting to read a certain number of books, you can literally see how many books you've read. So something that you actually can measure. Also, you want it to be, now some people call it attainable, some people call it achievable, right? Um, is the goal reasonable enough to be accomplished by me? In other words, if I've been getting, you know, if I am looking to lose 30 pounds in a week, that's not achievable, right? It's not even safe. So you want it to be something that you is a reasonable goal. And is the goal going to stretch you enough, right? If you already, you know, are reading three books a week, Right? I'm not saying you are, but then to say reading three books in four weeks, that's not, right? that's not really stretching you. You want to make sure you're thinking of something that is going to push you forward. Also, 
Some people call it realistic. Some people call it relevant. Is the goal worth your effort? That's where we talk about that internal motivation. It may be worth, you may think that it's worth their effort, right? And objectively, maybe it is worth their effort, but they don't see it, let's say, right? So is the goal worth their effort? And is it consistent with other goals that they have and their long-term goals? And also, is the goal reachable, even though it might be difficult or challenging? And then finally, time. When do you want to accomplish this goal by? And that's what makes it really a goal. Instead of saying, oh, you know, one day I want to make a million dollars, right? That's not a time-specific goal. There's no action steps, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to give you a few examples of what I mean here. Specific. I will turn my homework in on time every day. Now. Just to tell you, those of you who are familiar with executive function skills, and if you're not, um, we're talking about how we do what we intend to do, right? There's a lot I can explain about it, but I believe that if we shift our focus from grades to developing executive function skills, the planning, the organizing, time management, all those things, you're going to see the grades ultimately will go up. So just think about that. This is a perfect example of that. If I turn my homework in on time every day, that's going to help me in terms of reinforcing the learning I'm doing so that I ultimately will be doing better in school. Measurable. I will score an 85 or better on my science quizzes. Now, again, I highlight this. I don't, those are not my favorite measurable goals, but sometimes when it comes to measuring, we do need something objective that shows us we've been moving forward. Attainable and achievable, I will read eight chapters, eight chapter books by the end of the school year. And on a case by case basis, that could be a very reasonable goal. Realistic, I will eat fruit or vegetable every day. I think that's realistic, right? Time bound, I will learn how to 10 finger type by December. Now, I'm just going to put a little plug in for typing. A lot of schools have stopped teaching typing because they just don't have time in their curriculum. If your child is in second or third grade, that's really the best time when they should be learning 10 finger typing, QWERTY, right? If they're older than that, I would strongly recommend that maybe you make that a summer project because I don't care how fast they are with their texting and everything, they're never gonna type a paper as fast as I can with my 10 fingers. So what's the plan? Well. Once they have their goals written down, then they're going to need to write three or four action steps for achieving each of these goals. These action steps should be written down in an easy, attractive, accessible manner. They could have a dedicated binder for their goals. There are lots of really nice little booklets they can buy. They could do it on their computer. They could have a whole goal sheet on their computer or on their smartphone or you know, wherever they want to do it, they can do it on a whiteboard, something that is visual and they can really see it, okay? But the reason I say it easy and attractive is you want to feel like it's joyful to look at it. Um, these should be monitored either by the teacher or a goal buddy, sometimes by the parent, but I know that sometimes gets complex, right? But it's great to have an accountability partner. That's what coaching is all about, right? That's what good friendships are all about, where you share your goals with someone else and you would cheer each other on. You should choose a regular time each day to review your goals because you want them to be in, inside of you, but you also want to every day make sure, are you staying on task? Is there an action step you can cross off? Is there a next one you want to add on? And each month, you want to evaluate your overall progress and see you know what? Maybe it's time for a new goal. Maybe you've achieved it, or maybe you realize that it's not as motivating or effective or as important as it, we thought it was. So you may want to make some adjustments. Okay. Now I want to talk a minute about um, poorly defined goals, getting good grades, as I said. So if your SMART goal is during the first marking period, so in other words, instead of getting good grades, the SMART goal would be, the positive good goal would be, during the first marking period, 
I will complete my homework during the hours of six to seven on school nights at my desk in my bedroom. Notice how specific that is. After completing my homework, I will put my homework in a homework folder. I'll put it back in my backpack. At school the next day, I'll turn in my homework to my teacher. I will revise this goal after receiving my first marking period report card, right? So it is specific. It is measurable, right? The goal defines specifically how and where the behavior is going to occur. It's attainable. This goal is realistic because it specifies school nights, not every night of the week. It's attainable also because it's one hour a night. So it's not that you're asking it to change your whole lifestyle or get straight A's, right? It's relevant. So for a student um, whose incomplete homework was resulting in lower grades, this is going to be really good grade to help them improve. I mean, a good goal to help them improve those grades. And it's time bound. It names the specific time when the student is going to study and how often. And it's specifying the marking period so that the goal could be revisited and adjusted based on how they're doing. Okay, let me give you another example. How many of you as adults have said, oh, I'm going to get more organized, and that's your goal? Well, that's not going to be specific enough. So let's take a look at it. After school, on the first day of school, I'm going to organize my backpack by creating a folder or a binder for each of my classes. After my backpack is organized, I'm going to spend 10 minutes each day when I get home during the school year to go through the items in my backpack and make sure that they're in a proper location. I will then dispose of any items I don't need or that don't belong in my backpack. Very specific, right? It dresses what you want to accomplish. It's specific and measurable. I'm not going to read all of this. Um, the goal is realistic because it's focusing on one area to be organized, not just I'm going to be a more organized person. And it's relevant and it's time bound. We're saying exactly when you're going to do everything. All right. So those are, I hope, two helpful examples on showing you how to expand a goal to make it a SMART goal. So in terms of teaching goals, I would suggest that your kids all learn the terminology. Like I said, I hope that the teachers out there, I hope you can incorporate this in your, in your classrooms all the time. Using the wheel, design a plan to help the students choose a SMART goal from different aspects of their life. You can include the following, choosing actual steps for each goal, why the goal is important now, how they're going to keep track of the goal. You could have a student portfolio right, that shows you year after year or semester after semester. What are your goals? It's really nice to look back at, to see the goals that they achieve. What else can go in their student portfolio? Maybe a test that they feel really proud about. Maybe a paper that they wrote that, that they feel you know really spoke to them. Um, when and how they're going to monitor in their actionable steps. What role the teacher is going to play and the parent's going to play. I suggest you talk about that. One of the things I can tell you, and I talk about this in my parent workshop all the time, when parents get overly invested in their kids' goals, it can really backfire on you. Lots of different reasons, but the main one I'm going to mention is your kids get reluctant to share their goals. I'm not going to tell you next time that I want to learn how to play guitar because you're just going to go make it a big deal and you're going to ask me if I practice and, and it's going to become like your goal. So I'm not going to tell you my goals anymore, right? You have to be really careful. There's a fine line between encouraging and supporting and nagging and you got the idea. So what is your role as the parent and as the teacher? First of all, do not underestimate the value of your presence in cheering them on. Again, given what I just said, you want to make sure that you're not taking it on too much. But you can be there to support them. And sometimes the best way to support them is just say, hey, I know it's really working. Good for you. And then just kind of walk away. Don't become overly invested, as I said, in their goals. And encourage flexibility and adjustment. Help them stay intentional to why they're achieving the goal and maybe to why they want to adjust the goal. Maybe let go of certain goals. And as I said earlier, celebrate their achievements. Okay, you really want to celebrate those achievements.
Um, do you recommend um, adding, uh, for example, tools or resources that you're going to need to reach your goal when you're setting your goals? So, you know, going back to your example of make, doing your bike ride, you started off with a, a, a the bike, bike. and not the equipment that you needed. So should you take into consideration those things when you set your goals? Like I need to, um, I need to have a good bike. I need to buy the equipment that I need. Um, or, you know, for homework, I need to um, maybe get a tutor, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Thank you. I would put those in the action steps. So remember I said in each case, you need to have three or four action steps. One of your action steps might be, let me evaluate what I'm going to need to achieve this goal. So I can set myself up for success. So yes, that's a very good point and very good part of, of the goal setting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations for perhaps rewarding um, children as they meet each uh, milestone, you know, as they work towards their goal? Yeah, sometimes a little reward can help. Um, I want it to be something that the kids, you know, kind of come up with themselves, right? But um, we want it to be intrinsic. So ideally, if you're going to give an external reward, you want to first celebrate what they accomplished as the reward. In other words, your celebration of it can be the reward, having them talk about how they feel about it and everything else. So we're really reinforcing that because I find that those external rewards they don't always motivate as much as we'd like them to because especially when you've got a kid with adhd the further out that reward is it actually can backfire because then they feel like i'll never achieve that so what's the point of even trying to do this goal right so it does need to be really specific very timely and something that they're they're invested in all right that's an excellent point so celebrating those little successes over over time, we'll yeah. Yeah, keep things motivated and keep things going. Great. Yeah. And by the way, if anyone, I forgot to mention, if anyone wants me to send them um, the wheels and one or two other handouts that are relevant to this, um, I mentioned that they're in my book, but I can print them up. And so if you just email me at that email address, Cindy at PTS Coaching, I'm happy to send you, you know, some of those handouts as well. Okay, great. Thank you. How often is too quick to change goals? Do we change as often as needed? Sometimes I feel this creates room for failure and discouragement. That's a really great question. I would say before you change a goal, evaluate why you're wanting to. Sometimes the legitimate reasons, right? You know, again, thinking back to kids that join the soccer team when they're seven years old, right? And then they want to quit. And the parents say, well, I don't want you to be a quitter right? The thing is, they may not have realized what they were signing themselves up for. They may not have realized what that was like and everything else. So we want to help them feel good about making the shift of maybe not taking, you know, not achieving the goal, um, if that's really what it's going to be, or maybe choosing a different goal. So not just giving up on the goal, but, you know, coming up with the next, the next thing that they're going to do. Uh, do you recommend that teachers use the word intentions or just goals? Is there an acronym uh, for goals? Okay. Um, there is an acronym for goals, and for some reason I'm forgetting it right now. Um, maybe if someone remembers it, they can write it in the chat. I do like the word of intention. Um, to me, an intention is different than a goal. A goal is saying this is something absolute that I want to achieve. But I could say it's my intention to do this, meaning I'm going to try. So that's great. I always say, you know, I never like to make promises. It is my intention to do this for you or, you know, to, to keep this agreement that we made. I can't, you know, always guarantee it, um, but it's my desire. But I think it's nice to call a goal a goal. The next question is, how young should a child be to start setting goals? Uh, that could be really early on. I would say realistically, probably, you know, preschool. Um, but the goal could be something, you know, very short. But I want to be very careful here. I don't think it's appropriate. You know, all these sticker charts can really backfire. 
Like in other words, having the goal, you know, Johnny will raise his hand five times today. I don't look at that as a goal. That's not, that's not something that, that's necessarily a hundred percent within his control yet. Okay. I know it may seem that way. So be careful, but yeah, the, it could be their goal that they remember to put their clothes away when they take them off, that they remember to put their clothes in the hamper. So it could start very early on. As how do you earn your child's trust back after you have blown it? Because you nagged them or micromanaged them. I love that question. That's such an honest, beautiful question. I deal with that in the parent workshop all the time. You do it by a few things. First of all, you be real with them. You say, hey, you know what? I know in the past maybe I nagged you more than I should have. I'm, I'm learning and I really want to get better at that. Um, spending one-on-one -on -one time with them where you're just letting them see you in this gentle, you know, non-nagging kind of light is another way. And just asking them, you know, how they feel about it and what they would like, you know, how would they like their mom or their dad to show up differently so that the kids get that chance to speak. My child has a caseworker and her teacher both keep me informed, but I feel I'm out of the loop. So I think the question is, how um, how can everybody work as a team together to keep the child motivated to meet their goals in school? Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly think it's reasonable if they do have a caseworker, they probably have some kind of an IEP or a 504. Um, I know that with a 504, they don't necessarily have goals in the same way, and an IEP goals might be a little different than what we're trying to accomplish with the with the student for the student-driven goals. But I do think it's reasonable to say, hey, you know what? I want to support the efforts you're having in school, um, both verbally with my child and maybe at home, something I could be doing at home to support the goals. So can you please let me know what, you know what you're working on with Johnny so that I can be doing my best on my end? And if they're, they're reluctant to do that, then you may want to share with them a little bit about why you want to be involved in that. How do you minimize discouraged behavior? I seem to find even one failure will toss the whole day or week out. Again, meet them where they are. It's hard for me to answer that specifically because my, my philosophy is parent the child you have, right? Every child is different. It's hard for me to know what brought about that failure. Was the expectation realistic? Was the expectation something that the child had or was it the parent that had it? Um, what was leading to the failure? Um, a lot of times kids and adults can be a bit perfectionistic. So we want to help them learn what good enough is, what being on the road up the mountain is, right? Seeing that there's progress. Uh, we have a parent here, Laura. She asks, how do you help your child set goals when you struggle with them yourself? Mm, that's a great question. I would say talk out loud with your child and say, you know what? I, I just learned how valuable goal setting is. And I am not always great with it, but maybe you and I can be accountable to each other. Let's each come up with a little goal that we can cheer each other on with and, and support each other. So do it right along with them. So I have one more question. Um, Salma is asking, um, how would a parent um, become certified to train, like you are, um, other parents in, in setting goals and in coaching? Oh, that's a great question. I actually do train professionals and parents to become ADHD, executive function, parent coaches. I have a whole training program. You can email me. I'm happy to tell you about it. You can also look on my website. The program is um, approved by ICF, which is the International Coaching Federation, um, and CC Global. So you can get credits toward your certification in there. And it's a it's an amazing program. It's, it's um, oh gosh, it's 20, uh, 36 hours. The, the program and it's a really deep dive into parenting and the complexities of it, how to support parents. And this is one of the things we talk about with parents, goal setting. So it's great. If anyone wants to be a parent coach out there, we need more parent coaches. It's a really great profession.
All right. Well, it looks like we've covered um, all of our questions. Um, Cindy, is there anything else you wanted to cover before our wrap up? What I want to say is be patient. Your kids are growing. And I know that sometimes it feels like doors are closing. And we worry so much about they're not doing this. And they're so bright. And they're not doing this. and They're not doing that. You're better off meeting them where they are and helping them feel good about where they are and what that next step is. All that other anxiety is just going to build up in you and in them. So take it slow. If you need support, we're here. Great. Thank you so much, Cindy, for providing us with great information and tips. And thanks to everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being here.